And welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is uh, uh, American Issues Take Two. Um, and we have uh, our, our regular co host, Tim Apicella. We have our regular contributor, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. And we have our special elite guest, uh, <laughs> Tired Judge Shackley Raffetto in Maui. Uh, so thank you all for showing up today. Thank you for the time. But we're going to talk today about um, you know, what else can America do for Ukraine? And what can the government, uh, what what can the government and you do about about Ukraine at this point? How important is it? Uh, so I guess the big news, um, which just came out this morning, is that after a little bit of resistance from isolationists in the Senate, uh, eleven of them, uh, the Senate did pass the forty billion dollar aid package that the administration proposed for Ukraine. So uh, Tim, let me let me ask you to start. Uh, what does that mean? How important is that? Um, and, you know, does it change the game? It continues the game. Oh, by the way, thank you, Jay. Good morning. Uh, it continues the game. And that is to say that uh, Ukraine is held in their tough because they've already had weapons from England and from the United States and training. And as we discussed before this show is that uh, their, their <laughs> sense of, of battle or their armies were kind of reorganized to to mimic some of the Western style um, abilities of armies to operate in the field, which is to say you have um, battlefield command that you can have the autonomy to make decisions as situations change in the battlefield. And uh, Russia doesn't have that. They have a top down kind of style of, of command and control. And I think that's really a big part of why Ukraine is doing so well. And so now this 40 billion, I um, just learned that it's, you know, part of it's going to be for military weaponry, and then the other part for humanitarian purposes. Uh, but it's critical that the Ukrainians get these, these high-tech uh, anti-tank, you know, stingers and, and javelins, but also the traditional in the field, long range distant, uh, you know, weaponry like cannons and, and anti-aircraft. So this 40 billion comes at a very good time. And now the, the key is to make sure it's implemented quickly and get those weapons in the field to the Ukrainians as soon as possible. But it is a game changer. Forty billion is nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, uh, you've had time in the service. You've been observing the way the military works for a long time. Um, uh, so I give you on a given Thursday morning, I give you forty billion dollars. Uh, how would you spend it? How, what, how you? How would you leverage the best way possible? Wow, well, I'm not, I'm not a battlefield commander, uh, but it, se it seems to me that um, in, unless the, the um, Ukrainians are willing to accept the Russian um, ownership of, of their, the southern part of their country along the Azov, Sea of Azov and the Black Sea, they're going to have to become more offensive, and they're going to need offensive weaponry to do that, such as tanks and armored vehicles and probably aircraft. Um, and so I understand that I, I saw something on YouTube that that uh, the government is uh, uh, trying to mobilize a, a million men, Ukrainian men, for uh, to rebuild their or expand their military forces, and they're going to need enormous amounts of equipment. And uh, but some of it has to be offensive if they're going to retake the ground. Well, if I ask you to. Um... You know, round up a million men and probably some women too. Um, well, where would you get them from? Well, they, they have a country of what 40, 44 million people, uh, less a few million who uh, who are refugees now. So there must be a, a huge. And also, they they prohibited men from what eighteen to fifty from leaving the country. I think once the war started, so they have a a huge. Uh, I guess a huge. A manpower pool that they could draw upon, and they certainly have a lot of esprit de corps in terms of, um, you know, wanting to remain an independent country and to fight the Russians. So it seems like they probably could do that if they had the resources to organize all that. And that may be what the humanitarian assistance is partially for, mm -hmm. but as as in addition to weaponry. You know, we learned a few days ago, uh, Shackley, that. Um... Uh, American intelligence was feeding information uh, regarding the Moscova ship there in the Black Sea, uh, regarding the, a number of uh, Russian generals and so forth. 
and it it it, it could be uh, you know just a just a view through the keyhole into how much intelligence, how much support the United States is providing to Ukrainian government and military, uh, because I don't think we we're hearing it all. And in fact, there's, there was resistance, you know, about that issue about how much intelligence we should be providing. Yeah. Um, but I would guess, uh, and I wonder what your thought is. I would guess that we're providing a lot of support, moral support, um, mm-hmm. you know, non non kinetic support. Um, but nevertheless, people giving adv- advice and counseling and intelligence to the Ukrainian uh, military and government. We, we have, don't you agree we must have a much greater presence than appears on the surface? Yeah, I think, well, that's my view. Um, I think we have to recognize that we are, for all intents and purposes, into a, uh, a World War III, undeclared World War III. If you look at all the nations that are lined up providing support uh, for Ukraine, it's it's about the same number as uh, we're on the United, the Allied side in World War II, and uh, and and there's tremendous amounts of obvious effort being uh, put into supporting Ukraine and making them effective militarily to fight the Russians and all this the regime of sanctions that have been imposed upon the Russians. Sooner or later, that's gonna that's gonna have a real strong uh, tell on their economy. So I think that we we have to uh, recognize that we're that's where we're at and step it up. It's also a great opportunity to degrade the conventional military capability of Russia, so that we can keep them in a box and they won't get ideas about Poland and the Baltic states and uh, Moldova, for instance. Yeah, yeah. That well, that's that's a great concern, and it's funny that uh, you know a week or two ago, seems to me it's, maybe it's subjective, but I was more more concerned about that then than I am now. And uh, so therefore, you know, I, I, I believe this 40 billion is a, a great moral support, not only not only for the Ukrainian government and military, but for all of all of Europe, uh, mm-hmm. Western Europe anyway. But Stephanie, are you worried? Are you worried about, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, Vladimir Putin moving west, uh, you know, uh, digging his heels in, continuing a war of attrition? continuing to do this hybrid thing he does with the countries uh, in the Baltics and the Balkans. Um, uh, what, what's your level of concern about, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 the Russian, um, his, his ability, his will to keep on pushing? My worry is very high about that. I have absolutely no confusion about where his, his, trail is uh, marked to go and of course we're the end of it but um and all of the uh, the, the actions of uh, finland and sweden not uh, very very uh knowledgeable with the history that they've had you know with with russia over the centuries <laughs> and uh certainly um the little guys too lithuania and um all the rest of them are at, at great risk but um and so we'll see how that goes now and the question about the intelligence um out of Ukraine is an interesting one because the embassy has is going in or has gone in or is Im- imminently but going. They raised the flag yesterday. That's right. He raised the flag yesterday, and so they're putting State Department people in there, and I guess USAID, which will be helpful from the humanitarian point of view. But um, the uh, question is, um, then, does that mean there's intelligence going on there? I would think that it that it does, even though there's no security yet. And that that's a very risky business to be uh, in that that position for duty. There's no cover. There's no cover at that embassy. Yeah, for, and one one missile and it's all done. Yeah. Well, yeah. So let's see what happens because if he's not provoked, if Mr. Putin is not provoked by this, as we've been worried, I think Biden has said he's worried about Putin being provoked by all of this aid that that could be on his screen as oh, you know, you're going. Well, do you think the forty billion makes him more dangerous? Um, no, less because there's some um, defense that that it increases the defensive uh, capability of the Ukrainians. But I mean, he could certainly wipe it out, as you say, with one one missile. But um, will he do that? And it looks like Biden's, but he's not. And and it goes back to my other concern, which is that the military of the Russians has has not been very impressive. And they keep on stumbling and falling back and doing just awful things. So why do we think their nuclear arsenal is all locked up in gorgeous condition? 
I now question whether he's got that power. <laughs> you know, a, a, rust, a rusty nuclear bomb is not effective. I'll go <laughs> <on>. <laughs> it it doesn't go off sometimes. But anyway, those are the questions. So yes, it's um, it's still very dangerous. But I think uh, Biden's getting very aggressive <laughs> and has a lot of confidence that we're not going to get whacked back. But that going in with the embassy and the $40 billion, those are big moves. Big moves. Let's see if Putin will swallow that. Well, you know, we got some strange things going on in in Turkey and in Hungary. Um, the question, and they're trying to block uh, the uh, the efforts of uh, Finland and Sweden to join NATO, and trying to block the action by NATO to accept them. Uh, how concerned are you about that, Tim? Well, you need a unanimous decision. So obviously, Turkey is is leveraging. Uh, what exactly they're leveraging for? Uh, remains to be seen. Obviously, they're stating that they want the PKK or the PPK um, out of um, Finland or Sweden. They want those those folks handed over like they wanted uh, people in the United States handed over. Uh, when Erdogan you know, said that the ringleader of the uh, failed coup d'etat was sitting in the United States and he wanted them. Well, he never got them. So Turkey will come over. They'll, they'll, you know, they'll get a concession here or there, but they'll, they'll bend and this will occur. Okay, so they'll, I, they'll, I take they'll that They'll get point. Finland and they'll get Sweden to come into NATO. No, I, you know, I, I take that point. I agree with that, I think. And, uh, and I think that the 40 billion from the U.S. Uh, in, encourages uh, NATO yeah. to do that. It, uh, it's kind of a morale booster. Yeah. Um, you know, but, as a second part, though, you know, the 40 billion, really, if you think about it, it's just a down payment. So, you know, if you look at the title, what can be done to help Ukraine is um, Americans need to get behind this. Uh, they're going to have to recognize that GOP and the Democrats for the first time are going to have to cooperate over a shared interest. And if that means the Americans have to call their congressmen or their senators and say, hey, good job, uh, but don't stop at 40 billion and let the senators and, and representatives know that they have the backing of their constituents. That's a, a vital portion of, of where we go from here into the future. Yeah, well, I want to get into that. You know, Putin playing a war of attrition wants to anyway. And indeed, you know, over time you have a deterioration because just, uh, just as the Russian economy is suffering, uh, the European economy is suffering in many countries, including Germany. Um, and uh, people, you know, I mean, we, these are democracies and people get a little, a little unhappy uh, when they see the inflation, when, when they see the price of oil going up and they see, um, you know, uh, the troubles uh, caused by the war. Uh, and that's so in the U.S. And you get a fatigue factor that creeps in after a while. And uh, some say that the longer Putin can make a war of attrition, uh, the attrition is not only the attrition of, uh, you know, the, the Ukrainian troops fighting with him, um, but it's the, it's the whole coalition uh, in Europe. And it's, uh, it's our government and our, actually beyond the government, our people who, who uh, there's a certain isolationist uh, strain in the American sensibility, um, which which may pull the other way. Um, so I mean, how concerned are you about that? Because it, it depends on which which is moving faster: the success mm -hmm. in the Ukraine uh, or the uh, fatigue in mm -hmm. Western Europe and the U.S. Well, you know, yesterday on on my show, I, I mentioned a CNN poll about you know where the voters were for the midterms. And uh, you reacted quite strongly to when I said their interest is 59% of the economy, 30% to social issues, and 3% to foreign policy. And um, that was disconcerting because Ukraine certainly is, whether we like to admit it or not, a now a, a national foreign policy. And that is funding, funding them through taxpayer dollars. So I think, I think the interest in the United States will still continue. The, the, the American public is still behind it but it can't be taken for granted. And that means there's gonna be, you know, and that's up to our commander in chief to keep interest rolling as the dollars keep being spent. Yeah, there's so many issues, you know, sucking, sucking the air, <laughs> competing for top attention in the newspapers and the media. Hey, Jay. Uh, yeah, what, exactly. I had a question. I, um, what are, do you have any sense of how much the, um, the NATO and other other allies in this effort are um, putting forward? Like our forty billion dollars, is anybody matching that? 
I, I would I would guess this, but it's only a guess. I would guess that they're spending more than they thought they would spend by far. Um, but they're not turning upside down over it. And I think there's a certain level of concern in all of the countries in Western Europe that they cannot afford to spend all that much. And and I agree with your implication, namely that they're relying on the U.S. to bear the brunt. Yeah, I think I think uh, my own feeling is a, a, a substantial effort needs to be put up to uh, organize that, that uh, support from that from that uh, from the NATO countries and the other allies um, to stay in the game. And uh, right now it looks good, but as you say, uh, interest will wane once they the perceived danger it, it maybe decreases. But you know, Germany and oil, oil and gas from Russia. Uh, Italy is now talking about paying rubles for uh, oil and gas from Russia. And um, we, I think there are other ways that we can support those countries so that they don't go back to their, um, you know, sweetheart deals with Russia because it's easier to do that. I don't, I don't think we want them going back there. And if that means producing more oil and gas here, then that's what we ought to do. Well, you know that uh, there's two pipelines of gas uh, going from Russia uh, to Germany, which is a really important yeah. player here. Uh, go, uh, uh, what Nord Stream One and Nord Stream Two? They stopped Nord Stream Two early right. on uh, in the sanctions, and Nord Stream One is still functioning at 200 million euros per day paid yeah. to Russia by Germany. That one's still functioning. On the other hand, the United States is um, is building out uh, infrastructure to deliver uh, LNG uh, to Germany and replace that. Problem is, and this is really an important element of our discussion. The problem is to get its act together, uh, it's going to take two, three years, maybe closer to three, to build that infrastructure out so Germany can reliably have that, um, you know, have that supply of yeah. gas to re from the U.S. to replace the uh, the Russian gas. And so, it, 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 uh, and I'm asking it as a question, do we have that much time um, or will this deterioration, uh, you know, intervene before we are ready to help them? Well, I think it's going to last uh, for a while because uh, I think the the wake up call was pretty strong. Most, of, I mean, you had uh, Germany was you know uh, had made a lot of deals with Russia under Angela Merkel, and other countries had had um, received benefits from Russia, and now they're realizing that they've compromised themselves by doing that, and what compromise can lead to, and. Um, so I, I think it'll last a while, but it, it needs to be carefully managed is what I guess I'm getting at. And we need to pay attention to it. Well, you know, Seth, we've been talking about uh, you know, the Russian economy and there's a, an article in the paper or two or three articles in the paper every day about the problems in the Russian economy. And likewise, the problems of, um, you know, understated protest or sometimes visible protest um, by Russians, uh, despite the state television. Russians in Russia and outside of Russia, um, you know, saying it's a bad war. So do you see as a possibility, a, it's really a social political question, a political science question. Um, do you see as a possibility that Putin will have to stop, that the Russian people will make him stop, that he will run out of support, and that will happen suddenly, say, within uh, two or three years? Well, you know, I, I'm worried um, that at TikTok here too, because right, uh, Mr. Putin may be thinking he's got a last ditch effort that could really turn things around for him, and that's called the winter is coming. Okay, so Europe with no oil and gas is <laughs> not going to be in good shape for the kind of things that um, are on the weather horizon. So I, I think that that's very, very um, concerning, and that might be a part of his game plan. And if it is, that means that's a long time from now. We're talking about months and months if he thinks he can drag on there in New Ukraine and uh, get to that point where he'll really have another Trump, he'll a literal a card to play, a big one, because they're not going to be able to sustain um, the reduced uh, energy um, getting into December and January. So, I mean, the, and the other, the other point that's important to make is that Mr. McConnell came out um, yesterday or in the news anyway, and he made the point that we need to think about how if 
the, how much support this is that we're giving them and that we what's important about it is it it's a much better thing to do that now than to not give them any support so think about what would happen if we don't give them support and what the certain the consequences can be and of course those uh um and then one just one more point on the grit of these Ukrainian people, you know, you see the bombs coming in and the rockets hitting the buildings. And meanwhile, all these old men and women are out there with their broom, like sweeping it all up, like right. Uh, the story about this woman who, who paints flowers around bullet holes. She goes and, from bullet hole to bullet hole. To bullet is something out of the flower children of the sixties. Well, it's truly, truly impressive that they, and I, I mean, I think the Germans were kind of like that too, but they were really ra raised to the ground. But in this case, even though their their damage is just uh, tremendous, they're in there. I, I, in fact, I look at what they're sweeping around, and it's just like nothing left, but they're still cleaning it up. So hey, that it's just another salute to the stamina and the courage of these it people. Is, it is, and it's a, it's a tremendous uh, asset for you know for their effort in the war. You know, Tim, um, you know, one, one very interesting thing is uh, uh, there was a book uh, that came out on uh, Lawrence O'Donnell last night at MSNBC called Betrayal by Irish Shapiro, the journalist. And it's, it's, all, it's all about Mitch McConnell. And it, it talks about all the back and fill things that he's done over the past few years and how he has not served uh, the American people or, um, you know, any issue, including climate change. He's opposed everything on climate change, for example. Um, but, you know, we know that he's changed his mind a few times now. He he uh, went to Ukraine mysteriously last week, um, and he uh, claimed in the newspaper that he was uh, going to argue with Rand Paul about, um, you know, um, the isolationist position of uh, deferring the $40 billion, uh, you know, aid package this morning. And he apparently succeeded, according to his, his own aspiration in the matter. He may change his mind, you know. Um, and if the 11 people in the Senate who opposed the aid package were motivated by Trump and Trump stands a fair chance of becoming the, um, you know, the, um, uh, the Republican candidate for president in 2024 and even winning, getting back into power. Now, it is, I don't know if this is going to happen or not. Anything could intervene. Um, but but this has to affect um, the, the drama. It has to affect the way Putin sees the future of this. Uh, if he can wait until Trump is back in power, he's in much better shape. Uh, and Europe would worry about it. And, um, and, and for that matter, we might not expect the same kind of support uh, from Congress anymore. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Where does that play in, in, in planning and providing more aid um, and, and other support to Ukraine right now? Well, I think Shackley hit this one right on the head. And that was his comment or question about what are the European countries contributing for the assistance to Ukraine? Because if you remember Donald Trump's first um, declarative statements as a candidate was, NATO's not paying its fair share, therefore we should question our involvement with NATO. And um, so Europe has to recognize that if Donald Trump is the nominee, this issue may once rise to the surface of Donald Trump looking at what their contributions are to Ukraine versus what the United States is paying. And I, I think that they need to be proactive to make sure that per capita um, or their GNP, that they're, they're providing a certain percentage uh, of assistance, not just uh, nominal dollar amounts. And that way we keep Donald Trump at bay, at least on this particular issue, should he become the nominee. So I, I think uh, pre-planning and, and being proactive in that, in that effort will, um, will, if you will, foil any kind of criticisms about how we fund uh, our involvement with Ukraine. Exactly. I'm looking at everything we've talked about this morning, and I'm thinking that we stand a, a better chance of solving this problem, of stopping this war, of having Putin withdraw or, or lose uh, power in Russia if we move with, um, with, uh, with speed. Um, and that is, if we have the $40 billion, or at least 20 of it, for military affairs, and we should take aggressive steps now. The more aggressive, the better, in order to get him out of there. Get him out of there before the attrition uh, takes hold, before we get into political issues in this country, before um, you know there's a deterioration in the coalition, uh, and before he has a chance to use his hybrid 
uh, you know, kinetic and non-kinetic, um, you know, tricks uh, to change public opinion through hacking and propaganda, what have you. So don't you agree that if we are going to, if we have this money uh, and we have a timeline that requires, uh, uh, you know, quick action, that we should take quick action? You know, time is definitely of the essence here. Uh, but sustainment is, is also important, too. I mean, if, if you're thinking that uh, Mr. Putin would uh, uh, withdraw at some point, like he did from Kiev, that um, uh, he has to be convinced of, of uh, the deterrence that our support and NATO support for the Ukrainian people provides, and that it has to be real deterrence, and it's going to be there for as long as it takes. Um, but you know, th there are some questions about that because of our history. Um, but what about, you know, uh, you and I have talked about this. What about the no-fly zone? You know, <clears throat> in the beginning, Joe Biden was pretty tentative about everything, worried we'd have a nuclear war and all this, you know, didn't want to take these steps or that step, uh, didn't want to provide certain kinds of weapons, uh, wanted to keep it very, very low key. And no-fly zone was out. And, you know, the government must, must have said that a hundred times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but we're in a different place now. Uh, Russia's in a different place now. Um, he's already revealed his war crimes approach to things. Um, do you think we, we could be more aggressive? Should we be more aggressive? You mean in actually involving our troops? No, in, in organizing, for example, uh, no fly zone. Well, that would that, how would that, that would involve our airplanes, right? I think it seems not necessarily. To... They don't know how to fly our airplanes, um, and so it would have to be MIGs. But there are MIGs in various, um, you know, Eastern European countries that could be used? Well, I've, I've, I've actually heard, I understand Israel is going to provide Iron Dome to, um, to uh, Ukraine and some of their resources, which are very high quality. Um, it seems to me that the airplanes that the Poles had should go there. Uh, I don't, uh, and I think that we could provide enough um, anti-aircraft capability to pretty much uh, achieve um, a no-fly zone. As I understand it right now, a lot of the, the Russian uh, aircraft are, are actually not leaving uh, Belarusian or Russian airspace you know, to, in their sorties, although some are, of course. Um, so I, I don't know what else to add. To. I don't think we ought to be, be flying F-15s in there. Uh, no, that would be war. Yeah, but I, it seems to me we could achieve pretty much a no-fly zone uh, through uh, you know, anti-aircraft capability. Mm. Um, Stephanie, you know, you know, one of the elements that we should discuss is uh, what can we do about it? What can you and Tim and, and Shackley and me do about it? Um, you know, I mean, there's all this political stuff going on in the country, and I get, I get requests for money uh, every, every six minutes on my internet and my mail, um, and they're all asking me to support this, that, and the other thing. We have a sort of a national... Mm, uh, a, a national public opinion poll on everything um, and query, you know, and, and they all have a different way that I can help them, uh, even though I don't know who they are or what state they come from or what their positions are, I get requests. But this is an overarching. And my question to you is, uh, what can the average citizen do to make sure that uh, Joe Biden hangs, hangs in there? Well, I think that we can talk up more what it is that Joe Biden is doing. And I think that He's, he's really operating at uh, a meta level. And he's being, uh, and even at the same time that he's doing, he's not getting much credit for this, but he's, you know, we've sneaked into Russia and taken out that base that was supply and stuff. And now all this money's going over. And now you all are thinking that maybe he'd even be willing to put a plane in the air, which, which uh, Zelensky had asked for, but that uh, everybody kind of shot down is really actually a warlike act that Putin would respond to. But all of these things that, that Biden is doing, I think we ought to take a look at it, really think about them and see them for what they are, which is masterful for handling this. Situation. How's his rhetoric? Is it strong enough? And his rhetoric, because the Democrats don't take any credit for anything. His rhetoric. So, How is Joe Biden's rhetoric? Oh, is the rhetoric, yeah. Pretty good. Yeah, I, I think he's saying stuff like it is. And uh, 
and coming out with McDonald saying what he says. I think that is educating the population to understand this is serious. There are consequences for us if we don't get something to happen here. So I just think the individual people to, to not, not tolerate all this sniping and criticizing Biden about to look at what it is that he is doing. I think he's gonna come out of this at the end if Putin doesn't go crazy and push the button. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, and Biden's walking that line, but, you know, where he knows the guy's over there with his finger on the button. So, he, and he keeps creeping up a little bit more. So I think there's some real strategy going on here uh, on Bart. Uh, exactly. Should we be worried about crossing the line? Should we be worried about provoking Putin? How worried should we be? Um, well, if, if we're going to provide deterrence against him, then it has to be deterrence. I think we... We should do less wringing our hands about threats from Putin and more telling him that if, if he crosses a certain line, uh, he, may, he, he and a lot of his friends may die. Now, on the other hand, um, you know, you, he makes uh, ostensibly credible threats that we and a lot of our friends may die. Uh, can you wake up in the morning wondering and accepting that? <laughs> well... I hope I'm hoping that our leaders are a lot more clever than I am, and we'll figure out some way around that. But uh, deterrence has to mean deterrence; otherwise, we have a situation like we're living with right now. Yeah, absolutely. He wasn't deterred. Right. It's it's hard to deal with a pathological uh, leader like that um, because he's he's good. I mean, as as Trump said some time ago, he's a smart guy. He's good, and yeah. we're we're seeing the problem is that um, he's not that good. Adolf Hitler was smart. Adolf Hitler was smart. And he did exactly the same thing. <laughs> so, Tim, uh, you know, uh, trying to get a handle on all of this, uh, how important is all of this? How important is uh, the liberal world order? How important is it that we support Ukraine? How important is it that, um, um, you know, we, 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 we make sure that they have a good chance of winning this thing? Well, Jay, it's, it's not just a matter of supporting Ukraine. Although they're not a NATO country, there's the principles uh, that might doesn't make right. That, you know, here Putin could come in, a very strong nation, a very strong uh, as far as weapons and military force, and pick on someone, bully them. And so it's critical that the, de de you know, the democracies of Europe and of the world come together and say, this shall not stand. So it's a principle beyond the formation of NATO and the NATO countries. It's a principle about autocracies and, and, and two-bit dictators trying to run the world and democracy saying, no, you won't. To you, Shackley, we're almost out of time, but uh, you know, this, this plays a role in, in history for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and we are at an inflection point for sure. I don't think anybody would argue that. The world has changed. The world has changed big time. Yeah, and and I ask you the um, um, uh, the, the ghost of Christmas future question. Suppose mm. suppose we fail. Suppose we can't keep the coalition together. Suppose we can't get public opinion to support necessary funding and military assistance. Mm -hmm. And and we and we lose this. And Zelensky loses it. And Eastern Europe loses it. What happens? Well, we're back to we're back to Cold War, the Cold War. Soviet versus West. What does that look like now? Well, it looks like what it did then. We were worried that we were we were going to be attacked, and we had huge forces in Europe to try to prevent that. Although a lot of people felt that the they would roll through to the coast, uh, the Atlantic coast, anytime they wanted to. So it was great deal of fear at that time, if you, if you recall. And, uh, you know, that's why it went on so long. You say, um, you know, Cold War, but uh, wouldn't, wouldn't the failure of, of Ukraine, of Zelensky, the failure of the country, um, have an effect on uh, the ostensible emergence of autocracy in so many places, uh, which there's budding autocrats everywhere, it seems like. Uh, wouldn't that encourage them and thus change the the balance of democracy, call it? It, it could well do that. I mean, um, 
Stephen Kotkin of Yale was making that point the other day that Russia feels that it has a right to influence all these countries of Eastern Europe. And we feel just the opposite, that we're, 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 we should have the right to um, deal with them as individuals. Um, and and uh, as long as that uh, difference of opinion uh, persists, we're never going to be able to make deals with Russia. And, uh, and so the people of Eastern Europe are going to have to constantly keep in mind that uh, this mindset exists in Moscow and, uh, and deal with it accordingly. Right now, they're doing fine because they all want to join NATO, and that's very helpful, but that could change. Yeah. And one, one thing to add to that is, uh, you know, it's very interesting to see these, quote, I put them in quotes, peace talks, you know, uh, truce talks, if you will, between Russia and the Ukrainians going nowhere. And I think a good part of that, I would, I would favor the, you know, the Ukrainian view of it, is that you can't trust the Russians. You can't trust them in any discussion leading to peace because they simply don't mean it. It's, yeah, all, I, it's all just a tool. Yes, I agree. And I hope we don't force the Ukrainians to sell out uh, and leave the Russians in control of the southern coast of Ukraine. Yeah, amen to that. Okay, we're almost out of time. Stephanie, you go first. Final comments. Uh, I think uh, the Stalin um, in the peace talks, is, uh, Zelensky has said he's given no inch, not, not an inch of any of the dirt over there that's called Ukraine. So probably this is going to be a real, uh, you know, headbanger. So um, I think that if we don't win this, uh, or if the worst happens over there, um, that Biden's going to take that hit and he's going to go down. And for us, it's just going to be a disaster because we're going to get Trump back in blowing his horn about how he can fix it. We're going to get him back in and we're, we're over. We're living a new life in that condition. <laughs> That's nice. I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm very worried about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you know, uh, the thing about uh, world order is it can change quickly and it can change your life quickly. Jacqueline, your last thoughts about this? Well, it's World War Three. We have to stay the course and win. Win. Simple. There you go. Yeah. And Tim, um, your wisdom, please. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of what Ronald Reagan said countless times to uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. Idovini no provenai, trust but verify. However, I agree with you, Jay, there is no trust with the Russians. And it was a fool's errand in the late 1990s to think that Russia could come into the world stage as a, as a de democratic country and interact with the rest of the world as a, a, a team player with democracy. Um, they've shown their hand and the hand is obvious. Or to put them on the Security Council in the United Nations, oh. where they have you know, completely neutralized the United Nations. Well, thank you very much, Shackley. Thank you for coming around. Thank you for making the time. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. And thank you, Tim, for being my co-host and organizing this. And we'll go to, uh, what is it, uh, America is American Issues Take One on next Wednesday and, and number two, uh, American Issues Take Two on next Thursday. And we'll keep it going. And Shackley, I hope you come back and talk to us again soon. Thank you. Th thank you. Nice to see everybody. Thank you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.